Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming again today. If you were here yesterday, if you're new, um, you've now come to join us for our very special live climate session. Um, and this is being run in um, celebration of our work that we do at Ecotricity on education. Education about sustainability. Um, and we call the program that we run the Ministry of Eco Education. And we're very proud we've run it for two years now. Dale mentioned it if you were here yesterday, um, talking about the work that we're doing integrating into the curriculum. And today, this is about kind of bringing that to life. So I'm going to hand over now to Paul and to Chris, who are going to run this for you. And as you may have noticed, it has a little bit of a Forest Green Rovers twang to it, um, which would have to go because obviously we also manage Forest Green Rovers. So there's lots and lots going on. So I'll hand over to you guys. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming over this morning. Um, so my name is Paul and I am your climate teacher for today. Uh, I'm the education lead for the Ministry of Equal Education and we've had so much fun over the last couple of years traveling across the country, visiting schools and supporting schools to embed sustainability. So I'm going to remind you at the end of this, but hopefully you'll be inspired to do something yourselves. And one of those things you might do is to encourage your school or your grandchildren's school or, or your children's school or whatever it might be, a school near you, to get involved in the program that we're doing called the Ministry of Eco Education. So my name's Paul. I'm going to pass you over to Chris. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, there we go. There might be a lot of that, so bear with us. There seems to be some technical difficulties, which is why we're here, obviously. Um, as Paul has just said, my name's Chris. Um, I'm here to talk about uh, the Forest Green Rovers side of um, stuff, as Helen's pointed out. Um, I get quite a cool job, so I work for Forest Green Rovers Community, um, which means that I get to come out to events like this. I go into schools, uh, go into community, group, community groups, and I get to tell everyone about the fantastic work that Forest Green Rovers does. So I'm very blessed to be here. So thank you for having me here today as well, everyone. Really, really happy to be here. Just before we get started, I've got to ask this question. I feel like we should get some good answers here. Can anyone tell me what makes Forest Green Rovers so special? Vegan? Come on, we're not in school. I want to hear. Come on, let's get it. I know it's early in the morning, but I want people shouting out. I've heard vegan so far. Sustainable, I've had somewhere. Vegetarian, so we're vegan, so it's that as well. Anything else? I heard someone say something, but I didn't hear what it was. Green energy. Someone said League Two. I thought I was going to get away without someone mentioning the football, but here we are. Um, what makes us so special, and is everything that you've just said links into this, is we are classed as the world's greenest football club. So, has everyone heard of FIFA before? Yeah. So, FIFA are the ones that have accredited to us. Oh, okay. Before I know my words here, have accredited us with that title as, as well as the UN. So everything that you just said, vegan, sustainability, green energy, all links into one to make us the greenest football club in the world. So we're going to, throughout the session, we're going to talk a little bit more about it um, and I'll expand a little bit. But that's what makes us so special to start with. Um, and to begin with, well, thank you so much. So we need some volunteers who are going to help us to explain this. And we're going to start by using some of these. And what we need is we're going to have about four people who are going to need to hold these up in the audience. So I'm going to kick them out. Um, we're going to go on a bit of a journey. We're going to go on a journey uh, over the 4.5, 4.6 billion years, the history of the Earth. Now, I'm going to need one of these, Chris. So let's not lose them all. Um, so the Earth is a very, very special place. It is a complete... I would say fluke, the chances, the probability that the earth exists with human life on it is extremely, extremely rare. So we're very, very lucky to live on planet earth. It is, well, having said this, I think there's maybe some evidence that might be around to suggest otherwise, but it is the only planet that we know that supports life. So the Earth is a very, very special place, 4.6 billion years old. There's a few reasons why the Earth is such a special place. Does anyone have any ideas? What makes the Earth so special? If you want to put your hand up, and I'm going to come and roam, and we're going to find some people. Yes, hello. Goldilocks. Yes, you've stolen the word that I'm going to come to in a minute. We're going to save that. The Earth is the Goldilocks planet. There's some, let's hear some other things, though. What else? 
atmosphere. The atmosphere, yes. The Earth is ex incredibly fortunate to have an atmosphere. And the atmosphere is a bit like a blanket. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. So there's a few other things, though, that make the Earth very, very special. Okay. Water. Water. H2O. Yes. So one of the only planets. I know that there is research to suggest maybe that Mars might have frozen water. Atmosphere. What else? There's a few other things. To... Oh, yes. Humans, yeah. But what's the reason why humans? We've got an atmosphere. We've got water. There's something else that the Earth is a bit special about the Earth, yeah. Gravity. Gravity. Yeah, that probably is a good one, isn't it? I think gravity, yeah. Vegetation. Yeah, these are all things that because of water, maybe. What else? Yeah. Moon. Yeah, again, kind of, yeah, helps us with those. What about the orbit of the Earth, the distance from the sun? Yeah, we are the third rock third planet from the sun. But the one we're going to talk a bit more about then is the atmosphere. And what I would like is everyone who's got a globe, I would like you to stand up and we're going to spread you out. So it might mean taking a little journey. If you want to view head out over there, let's spread out so everyone can see. Spread out around the audience. Spread out, spread out, spread out. Do you want to head out that way? And actually I will need someone to hold my earth. Would you like can I ask you to hold my earth? This one, what's your name? Alexander. Alexander, Alexander, can you hold my earth, please? This is a very, very special job. Okay, so in the center of the universe is the sun, a ball of gas releasing energy out into space. And the earth orbits around the sun in the Milky Way, in our galaxy. This feels a bit surreal, we've got too many earths here, there is only one earth. Um, but some of that radiation that is released from the sun reaches the earth. And you can feel it on your skin on a hot sunny day. You know, if we were here yesterday, you might be feeling that heat on your skin. Now, we were just talking about the atmosphere and a really good way to think about the atmosphere. It's not as a greenhouse. The greenhouse analogy is a slightly funny one. It's much better to think of it like a blanket. So what we need is five jumpers. Is there anyone near? one of the Earths who's happy to hand over a jumper or a coat. We need some coats. And what we need is one jumper on each of the Earths. So I'm gonna show you over here what we've got. So there's someone holding the Earth and then we're gonna put a blanket on it. And that jumper, that blanket is just like the Earth's atmosphere, made up of lots of different layers, lots of different gases. But the job it does is it traps heat. It keeps the Earth at a nice, comfortable, habitable temperature. It makes it a lovely place for nature to thrive. So the atmosphere, really, really important. Now, hundreds of years ago, centuries ago, humans came along. So humans actually have not existed for a very long time. There's a really good way to think of it. If you were to stretch your arm out, through the 4.6 billion years of the Earth, humans have only been around for about the length of your fingernails. So humans have not been around for very long, but the time they have been around, they've had a big impact on the planet. What is it that humans have done? Any ideas what humans have done? They've done lots of things. What do we think? Fire. Invented oil. Found fire. And we used fire when we dug up fuels. We burnt wood, but we also found oil, coal, and gas, fossil fuels. So we, we found these things in the ground. And actually, you know, in the UK, in, in Britain, we were one of the first places to find this coal at the surface. And we dug it up, we burnt it. And when we burnt that, what did it release? It released something. Does anyone know? Magic word. Someone's got it, yeah. Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. So this gas that we're really worried about. So we need another jumper, another jacket for each of the Earths. Is there another one? Can I borrow yours? Let's have a look. So humans found oil, coal, gas in the ground. We dug it up and when we burnt it, it released carbon dioxide into the sky, into the atmosphere. And that added another blanket to the Earth. So have we got two blankets on all the Earth? Have you got two? 
Do we need another blanket? Is there another jacket? Is there someone who's got a thank you so much? Okay. Now, if you had to wear two coats or two jumpers all day, how would you feel? Would you feel? What would you feel? Hot. You would feel hot. And that is exactly what has happened to the earth. Through human activity, we've added an extra blanket to the earth. And it traps more heat and it makes the earth too hot. Now, if you were too hot, what would you do? If you were wearing two coats, what would you do? Take one off. Take one off. You take off one. Is it easy for the earth to just take off a jacket? No. Now, we are very lucky, particularly where we are now. If we look round, there are things in nature that do that, that suck carbon out of the sky as part of natural cycles and do help to keep the amount of carbon dioxide in the sky and the atmosphere in balance. If you want to, feel free to come forwards if you want to get out of the rain a little bit. It's definitely a bit more sheltered here. There's lots of space. We can drag the bean bags. We can all come a bit closer. So we've got our two blankets, our two jackets. I've said there are things in nature that, that do that, that do take carbon out of the sky. But sadly, they don't do it at the scale and the speed that is needed to take it out. What we need is also like big hoovers to suck the carbon dioxide out of the sky and to bring the level back down to a safe level. And if anyone was here yesterday, you might have heard Dale He's sort of having a play at that. He is doing something like that. What was it that he's sucking carbon out of the sky and making? It was diamonds, wasn't it? Sky diamonds. So over in Stroud, not far from here, there's a little factory warehouse laboratory sucking carbon out of the sky with hoovers. Now, he's doing that at a very small scale. There are places doing it slightly bigger. In Iceland, there's a place doing it. But we need that on a bit much bigger scale. So that's one thing we need to do. Another thing we need to do is we just need to stop burning fossil fuels, to stop adding to this blanket. Have we done that? No. Okay. Thank you so much to the people who were holding the earths. Do you want to return the jumpers to the people who, uh, who very kindly offered them? Should we make sure the jumpers get back to the right people? Ooh. And then you can sit back down and you can keep hold of those earths. Thank you so much. Now, over the last about 150, 160 years, since a very special event, that moment that humans found oil, coal, and gas in the ground and started burning it, what was that called? What was it called? Does anyone know? It was the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, this moment in time that changed everything dramatically. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, the world has got, on average, about 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer, which, does that sound like a big number? 1.2 degrees. It doesn't, does it? And that's one of the problems with the climate and nature crisis, is the numbers themselves don't sound scary. If someone said, ah, tonight it's going to get 1.2 degrees warmer, you'd be like, doesn't mean anything. The difference between the night and day temperature can be 10, 15 degrees. It depends, you know, around the world, it can be really dramatic. So we need to put that 1.2 degrees into context. Now, one of the ways we can do that is we're going to use a banner that is just around the corner, which is going to involve everyone standing up and moving. So please leave your things where they are and do stand up. I'm going to grab one thing from the stage. And then Chris is going to guide you around the corner so we can go and have a look at this very special banner. Okay, so this banner was made by a person called Ed Hawkins, who's based at the University of Reading. And this actually has become very famous. There is another football club, not Forest Green Rovers, University, oh sorry, not University of Reading, but the Reading FC, who use this on their football kit. Now, what this does is it starts over here in 1850. And as I travel this direction, I'm traveling through time to the present day over here. 
each stripe is a different year, and the darker the blue, what do you think that might mean? The colder? Yeah, darker the blue, the colder. Darker the red, the hotter. Yeah, the warmer. So it's from a uh, like climate average. So there's, there's, there's a kind of another thing that a lot of people need to get to know, which is the difference between weather and climate. Does anyone know the difference between the weather and the climate? And it often gets confused because people will say, it's really sunny at the moment, or it's been really warm this year, or it's been really wet, or it's been really dry. Have we got a good definition? Uh, weather is a day-to-day -day incident and climate is a more ongoing situation. Yeah, and we often talk about the climate being an average over 30 years. So if someone says, over the last 30 years, I have noticed that the summer have got warmer, or the summers have got drier, you know, that's fair to say. But if people say year to year, oh, it's a bit wetter or it's a bit colder, it doesn't mean much. That's not the climate, that's the weather. Now, climate change does affect the weather, but we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Now, what we need are people of varying ages. So, 1850, how many years ago was that from the present day? I don't think we've got anyone here who was born in 1850. But do we think we've got someone who was born close to 1850? I don't want to... <laughs> how old can I ask? It's a personal question, isn't it? Okay, would you like to come and stand? <laughs> you're going to be our, you're, you're our token 1850. So if you come stand here, and then if you'd like to hold that. Okay, so in 1850, when this graph started, this is the amount of carbon dioxide that was in the sky. Measured in something called parts per million. It means if you took a million molecules in the sky, there'd be 285 that were carbon dioxide. Does that sound scary? No, because you go, it's a number. What does it mean? It's got no context. It's going to be important, though, because I've got relative numbers. So you'll be able to see how the numbers change through time. Okay, the next one then is 1912. Who's the next oldest person? <laughs> you don't have to be the oldest. We, we can play this differently. But So if you'd like to stand about there, in 1912, 301. What's the difference? Not quite, is it? What's the difference between those two numbers? What is it? 16. 16. OK, so it's gone up 16. Now, we've got a slightly different gap now, though. We're going to go to 1980. So who here was born 1980? Are we lucky enough to have someone who was actually born in 1980? Great. And can I? how old does that make you, can I ask? 43. OK, 43. Don't say it too loudly. So 1980, there was this much carbon in the sky. 341. What's the gap, the, the number difference? 40, yeah. OK, and then the last one, this was the, the last time I printed this in 2021. So I, we're not going to have anyone born in 2021, but who's maybe the youngest person we've got? We've had someone actually who's had a sixth birthday today, but have we got anyone who's five, four? How old are you? Six. Well, Connie, would you like to come and hold this one here? So this was actually two years ago. Um, it was at 411 parts per million. Today, it's more like 420 parts per million. And you can start to see that rate of change. Now, there is a magic number that we think is the safe or the scientists have agreed. And actually, it was the name of a really prominent charity and organization. Does anyone know the name of the number or the, what the number was? 350. Yeah, the 350. That is the number that we think we need to get back down to to keep the warming below a, a, like a perceived safe level. And maybe we can explore that a bit more, what that safe means. Um, we are up at 420 parts per million now. We need to get back down. That's where we need those big hoovers, or we need you know, more nature. We need more of something. We need definitely a change. We need to do things differently. OK, thank you so much for entertaining me with this. Um, I'm going to collect back up these. And do we want to go and sit back down? Because we're going to switch to a different activity. We talked about human activity, but what we can actually do is think about grouping those sorts of things. So we're going to have a go thinking what kinds of human activities are having an impact. Cool. So, like Paul said, we're going to start thinking about what we're doing 
as humans, it's making an impact on the world. So we've got some categories around that I'll reveal to you very, very shortly. Um, but just to start with, can we get any hands up of what we think any of these may be? What are we doing as humans that are having an impact on the world? Anything? Go on. Travel in. Good answer there. You're louder than me with the mic. Go on. E eating um, animals. Eating animals. Lovely. So food. That is a great answer. One of my favourite ones. Anything else? Oh, yeah. Fossil fuels. Fossil fuels. What do we use fossil fuels for? Electrics. So energy. Well done. Have we had anything? Everything? Oh, there's one more, and no one ever gets this one. Um, can anyone right, guess it? Have a think about where we are. Trees, so what are trees? No. Nature, okay? So the four pillars that we always look at, and that's across all the different things that we do, is energy, transport, food, and nature, okay? So we've got some wonderful volunteers here that have got our gold signs. Um, so what I want you to do is I want you to vote with your feet. I want you to go to these people and decide which you think is having the biggest impact in the environment at this moment in time, okay? So if we look, where have we got? So we've got an F for food, a T for travel, N for nature, and E for energy. So if you just want to have a little vote with your feet, which ones do you think are having the biggest impact? I appreciate that you've only just sat that down. <laughs> so thank you very much for everyone that is doing it. Okay, so we do have energy just here as well. I'm going to get back on the stage, not very gracefully, so I can see it better. Okay, so we've got a lot of people coming for energy. So we've got quite a few for food, that's great. Nature, a few people. Oh, we look like the majority have got energy. Transport's just at the back over there, our tea. <laughs> Amazing stuff. So thank you very much. We've got a lot of people there. So I think we've got, having a look, most people have chosen energy, right? I think that's a, a, fair, a fair one. Right, okay. Paul, can you, eat, can you uh, tell us which is the biggest impact? Yeah, so this is interesting. Are we talking about globally? Are we talking about the UK? Now, globally, yes, energy is our largest proportion of carbon dioxide emissions. It's our greatest impact on the planet, closely followed by transport and then food but we could debate these things and scientists group them together in lots of different ways what's important is to realize that each and every one of these four pillars is really really important and we're at a time when actually we just need to do it all we don't need to think which is the most important we just need to do it all in the uk there's a slightly different story because actually we've done very well with our energy and we have decarbonize. We've re removed the carbon from lots of the ways that we produce our energy. There are some things lacking behind, things like the petrol we use for our vehicles, and a big proportion of vehicles on the road are still petrol and diesel. Okay, thank you so much. Do you want to sit back down? Thank you very much, guys. Um, if anyone's holding the wonderful signs, would you mind just joining me just at the stage here for a second, just to remind people of our four pillars. As mentioned earlier, I'm obviously here from Forest Green Rovers community, so I want to explain a little bit about what we do, um, one that's different to every football club across the world, um, but how it fits into all the pillars that we've got in front of us. And as you can see, in order-wise, it doesn't matter too much at this moment in time um, because, like Paul said, all of these are really important. It's something that we all need to make sure that we are considering as we go along. Perfect. Right. So we're in order. Right. First things first, we've got energy. So at Forest Green Rovers, um, what we try and do is we try and make sure that we're using all um, sustainable energy. So has anyone been to the stadium before? A few. Lovely stuff. Well, where is it? It's a great question. So we are based in Nailsworth. So if you've ever been to Nailsworth, we're right at the top of the hill. Perfect location. So hopefully we can change that if there's only a few hands. Where's, where's Nailsworth? Good question. <laughs> uh, Nailsworth is uh, about 50, 20, 15 minutes away from Stroud. So Gloucestershire. Okay. So if you're thinking, there we go. As you can tell, I'm not here for the geography side of stuff. <laughs> um, 
But yes, um, we are the energy wise that we're using. If you come to the stadium, the first thing you'll see as you as you drive in is a solar panel. It's the first thing you can see as you're coming into the into the stadium. And also on top of our stadium, we have more solar panels. So we're trying to create as much energy as possible on site. So at the moment in time, we create around 20% of our own energy. And the rest of it is supplied by Ecotricity, the wonderful people that put this uh, tent together today. Um, so we try and make sure everything that we use is sustainable. And we are moving to a new stadium. And when we move to that new stadium, the plan is to actually have 80% of our own energy on site. Question. <laughs> I always get the hardest questions. <laughs> um, well, first of all, that's not dictated by us, um, otherwise we could do. Uh, three o'clock kickoffs are set by the, the English Football League and we have to um, go with what they are, they are saying. But at the stadium, we make sure that all of our um, floodlights are LED and they are as eco-friendly as possible. But it's a good question and it's something that actually the Football League has looked at, especially with the energy crisis going on at the moment, changing earlier because there are small teams out there. We are, Nailsworth is around a population of around 6,000. Our capacity is 5,000. So you can see that we are actually the smallest team in the Football League. So that kind of stuff, not even just the energy impact it makes, it does make an impact on smaller clubs as well. So it is something that's been spoken about and it's definitely something we would push. Um, and I'm going to move swiftly on and I feel like I've dealt with that quite well. Um, right. <laughs> Next up is our transport. Um, coming to uh, Forest Green Rovers. So first of all, first thing you'll see after your solar panel is you will see our um, charging points for cars. So that's energy as well. But we're encouraging people that if they are coming to be using electric cars, um, but also when getting to games, we want to be uh, encouraging people to get there as most sustainably as possible. Now, it is right on the top of the hill. So if I said cycle, I couldn't do it. I will definitely say that. But we do encourage people to cycle, to walk, or to take public transport. We do offer a park and ride on a Saturday so people can uh, go there um, and, and come up. So we're trying to get people to be there as the most sustainable way possible. Um, and obviously, when we have our new stadium as well, there'll be more options for park and rides um, and even more places for people to charge. Um, bus stops? Yes. Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, the links through Gloucestershire are quite good at the moment as well. So you can get from Gloucester to Stroud and then Nailsworth quite easily. So yeah, trying to make people use that as much as possible. And it is going to be a, a canal next to the new stadium as well. So people encouraging people to cycle, walk, even get a boat down there. So we are trying to get the most unique ways and the most eco-friendly ways as possible. Right, what have we got here? Food, right. This is obviously one of the biggest things for us at Forest Green Rovers. We are a completely vegan football club. So if you come to the games, uh, we had a few hands there, um, then all the food that you get served there will be completely vegan. Um, and all of our players, when they are at the training ground or at the stadium, will also eat um, vegan food as well. I'm going to answer this question because someone's going to shout it out. I know they are. And they're going to try and catch me out. Are they always vegan? Now, obviously, when they're always on site and they're representing Forest Green Rovers, they are completely vegan. And actually, what we find a lot of is a lot of them will go to different clubs. Um, a perfect example is a football player called Kane Wilson. Um, he came to Forest Green Rovers. Um, he was in academies at Premier League clubs, came to Forest Green Rovers, found the vegan diet and actually continued it. And last year he was at Bristol City and he's just moved on again. So it shows the impact that we have um, with the food there. And the reason we do that is the impact on the environment, but also how it helps um, performance as well. If you look, there's a lot of professional footballers now. Uh, Messi being one of them, do you all know who Messi is? Perfect. That, <laughs> that helps me as well. Lionel Messi, the greatest footballer to ever live. Debatable. We won't get into that right now. Um, also tries to have a vegan diet as well. So it shows the impact that it can have at elite level um, all the way down. Yeah, we've got a question. So, yeah, so we have um, lots of different suppliers around. So um, another company that is um, part of the, the, the Green Britain group is our Devil's Kitchen that supply all, our, all of our vegan food. And we try and work with local people as much as possible. So Stroud Brewery, um, you'll find them if you go into any of the bars over there. Um, it's quite a unique one. There's a farm in Wiltshire where we get the, um, the oil for the chips. Once we've used it, we actually recycle it, give it back to the farm for them to use as um, 
biofuel. So yeah, we try and make sure that we limit that as much as possible. Or if then we are working with people that might be a little bit further, we make sure they align with who we are and what we stand for as a football club. So we're surrounding ourselves with the right people. But yeah, we do try and keep that carbon footprint as low as possible when it comes to food. Last one is nature. And I think this is my favourite one to talk about. So if you come to Forest Green Rovers, it's a very unique stadium. Has anyone been to other stadiums across the world? Yeah, just shout some out for me. Seoul? Manchester City? I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> oh, Mexico City. That's right. That's even better then. Um, so if you go to stadiums across the world, across the UK, it's a concrete jungle, isn't it? You go into the, the city centre and all you're surrounded by is loads of different buildings. Um, the perfect example is actually Liverpool and Everton. Literally separated by a park and it's houses all around them. Again, we're very unique. You come to us and you see everything and it's all... I think a lot of people might come to us and think that we've let stuff go a little bit and we're not trying to keep everything up. But we do that on purpose. We make sure the nature is growing around the stadium to make sure that we're encouraging uh, different wildlife in the area, especially because we're not going to be there in a few years' time. And what we don't want is the animals in the area to be relying on us. They need to create their own habitat so when we're gone, and they're not relying on anything that's supplied by us anymore. But the most important one for nature is our pitch. Our pitch is completely organic. And when, when I say that, people look at me like I'm mad because they're like, well, obviously, it's a grass pitch, right? Not the case. So first of all, there's stadiums across the world, like Gloucester Rugby for one, that is a complete 4G, so it's completely plastic. Um, but other stadiums that are grass, what they do is they put a little bit of plastic into the bottom layer of the grass and in the grass itself. This helps it grow, and it also makes it look a little bit better. That's not the case at Forest Green Rovers. It is complete grass, and everything that we put on there is natural as well. So... Although the rain isn't great for when you're sat here trying to listen to us talk about this, it's great for our pitch. And we make sure that we um, keep all that and then we can water the pitch on dry days as well. And any of the excess water will drain off back into that tank to reuse. The most special thing, and this is definitely my favorite thing to ever say when talking about uh, what we do at FGR, is just outside, there's a little the white building. Looks like some of the stuff you might have seen around for the away fans. And it's their toilet. Again, bear with me, bear with me on this one. So in, the, in there, um, we have a system that it collects the pee from the away fans and then we put it on the pitch. And now the biggest question that ever comes to me is, does it smell? Thankfully, no. Um, so it goes through a system. It's a closed loop system. It's very similar to how they'll have drinking water on the International Space uh, Station that takes all the nutrients out of it and we can put that on our pitch. So again, we're creating everything to make sure it's as natural as possible. Um, and we also use different natural things like seaweed. So nine weeks ago, the grass got pulled up and they had to start putting stuff down and they put seaweed down. And it was great because it smelled like the beach the whole time and it felt like I wasn't working anymore. Um, but yes, everything that we do on the pitch is completely natural, completely organic, and is very unique across the whole of football. We are uh, kind of the only team to do this kind of stuff, but people are trying to learn from us as well and embed it into the rest of um, what we're doing. Good? You've obviously heard me talk too much now, um, and I will move on. As long as it's an easy one. <laughs> so the motto of, of the people that did it, and I will say this, and I'll, I'll say this politely, is to take the P out of the away fans. Um, but one of the main reasons is um, if you come to the same, so what we do as well is we, we try not to build anything on site because we're not going to be there in a few years. We're building a whole new stadium. So the last thing we want to do is create loads of work that's going to make a bigger impact. So the current toilets have been there since 2006 when the stadium was built. So the job to put that into the home fans would be a bit difficult. With away fans, we don't make the away area very nice. So it's probably the nicest bit they've got. So because it's easier to put it out there, um, and even where they have their drinks and food and stuff like that, um, we don't actually build on that. So that's why, and it will be a plan for the, the stadium for all of it as well. But good question. <laughs> Thank you so much to uh, the people holding the letters. Do you want to go and sit back down? Thank you so much. So this is going to be a step change as well. We're going to change a slightly different activity. I'm going to ask Chris. I'm going to change my outfit because I'm going to change from your climate teacher to... Bear with us.
yeah, this was meant to have an air of dramatic. Um, I am now your climate game show host. And what we're going to have is a series of game shows that are going to help explain a bit more about the climate and nature crisis. So what we need is someone who thinks they are an expert on the cl climate and nature crisis. We need one person who's willing to come up and take part in, we have one volunteer. Please do come up. You're gonna have, the audience is gonna help you. We're gonna play a game of mastermind. So we've got a chair, there is one special. It's not quite the mastermind chair. We're gonna have to use our imaginations. Would you like to come take a seat? What's your name? Georgia, okay, um, you're right, getting up. Okay, so we've got five questions, slight adaptation on the mastermind format as well. And what we would like is for you to help shout the answers as well, if you need some help, okay. Um, we're gonna have to share a mic, I think, as well. So the first question is, we do need that music, don't we? The doo -doo -doo. Um, what was the record-breaking temperature experienced in the UK last summer? It was 40 degrees centigrade. Yeah, 40 degrees Celsius. So, yeah. so now we are applauding 40 degrees. Sounds exciting, but actually it was record-breaking. The UK has never experienced temperatures like that. And we've just gone through a period where other parts of the world have had exactly the same. Forest fires, temperatures, you know, extreme periods of warming. It sounds exciting, but actually it's very dangerous. And what you might have heard is we're now going into a period of history where we're experiencing global boiling. So we're not talking about global warming anymore. We were for a while talking about global heating. We're now talking about global boiling, where temperatures are breaking records. And actually, there's another good way to put this. We are now experiencing the coldest summers that we will for the next few decades. So even though we're breaking records and it's getting warmer and warmer, the next few decades are gonna be even worse. Okay, that sounds very happy, doesn't it? Okay. Question two is, throughout all of human history, which country has emitted the most carbon dioxide? Which has produced the most carbon dioxide? Which country? Do you need some help? No, no. Okay. I'm, I'm going to say, it depends how you count it, which is important, but I'm going to say the UK. Ooh, interesting. So... Well, no, so I haven't said per capita, I've just said which country total. You, are you sticking with the UK? The USA. The USA. Okay, let's hear from the audience. Who thinks China has produced the most carbon dioxide in human history? It isn't. Who thinks it's the UK? The UK is fifth throughout human history. It is the USA, you're right. Throughout all of human history, the USA has produced the most carbon dioxide. But are countries a good way to think about this? But also borders and countries are, are human constructs, aren't they? Carbon dioxide moves all around the world and maybe labeling it by country is a funny and silly way to do it. Maybe there's better ways we can think about this. I was glad that you brought up the per capita as well. That's an interesting one. Okay, it's what are we on? Number three, which eco-entrepreneur with a vision for a green Britain, is turning atmospheric carbon dioxide into diamonds? Ooh, uh, somebody that I should talk to about getting some jewelry made. I don't know. <laughs> I, have, I don't know the answer. Who was it? Dale Vince. Yeah, so founder of Ecotricity, Dale, eco-entrepreneur who funds the Ministry of Eco-Education, all kinds of initiatives. Sky Diamond is one definitely to check out. Dale Vince. Okay, number four. We've got two questions left. Number four. Last year, say so last year, what percentage of the UK's electricity was produced by the wind? What percentage? I'm going to say... 17 percent. 17, one seven. Any other guesses? Have we got some other guesses in the audience? Put your hand up if you think higher than 17 percent. 
How much higher? 30? Again, it depends where you look, but I reckon it was between 40 and 50%. So when we were talking about that story of energy, the UK has definitely, even though it could do more, set up lots and lots of wind farms, most of them offshore, and now we've got about half of all our electricity from wind. Okay, number five. How much land in the UK is built on? What percentage of the UK has got buildings and roads on it? Can I use the same percentage twice? Yeah. 17%. 17%. Who thinks, put your hand up if it's more than 17% that has buildings and roads on it? Okay. I think slightly less than half. Put your hand up if you think less than 17%. Does anyone know the answer? 5%, yeah, 5, 6, 7%. It is a very small percentage of the UK that is built on, but we think it's much higher because we spend most of our time in houses and on roads and cars and traveling around these spaces. But actually, the majority of the UK is not built on. What is the majority of the UK used for though? And actually, for one very particular type of agriculture, do we know what the answer could? This is like a bonus question. Which type of agriculture uses the most land in the UK? Uh, I, like, uh, I don't know how, what the proper name is, but animal rearing? Yeah, exactly right. So m the majority of the land in the UK is used for rearing animals. Is it a good use of space? Is it the best way to get our food? Who knows? Um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking part. Okay. Now, okay, we are now going to pull out the coin. <laughs> I've brought a very special coin with me. It is the coin of climate action. Ooh. Now, on this coin, there are two sides, like any coin. There is a heads and a tails. Now, we've talked a lot about things that we could do to help stop climate change. And so we talk a lot about individual action, but people also say there's problems with that, isn't there? How much can I do? People often go, what about China? What about someone else? Now, it's true that a very small proportion of people around the world have produced most of the carbon dioxide. It is actually the richest 10% of people in the world. Now, does anyone know what you would need to earn in the UK to be in the top 10 richest percentage of people on earth? Any guesses? How much might you need to earn? 50,000. 10,000, okay. To be in the top 10% richest people on earth, who have caused 50% of all the carbon dioxide emissions throughout human history, you'd need to earn minimum wage in the UK, about 16 and a half thousand pounds a year. So what it does is give you some context about our lifestyles in the UK and actually how much of that warming we are and have been producing. It is true though, that it is a very small proportion of people. It's about 400 million people in the UK, or sorry, in the world, who have produced most of the warming. And actually it's the poorest, Four billion people, the poorest 50% of people on Earth, who've only produced 7% of all the carbon dioxide emissions. Now, 50% of people, 4 billion, only 7% carbon emissions. Does that sound fair? No, it doesn't really, does it? And actually, if we were to make that balance and be fair, how much carbon would they need to produce for it to be a fair situation? What percentage? Where should it be? If it's 50% of people, how much of the carbon should they emit? 43. You think 43? What about 50%? If it's 50% of the people, should it not be? So you're saying like an extra 43%. Yeah, so it makes it 50. So actually, the poorest people in the world, maybe they need to be able to emit more carbon. And it is a very small proportion of people who those individual actions would have a significant impact. And maybe we are part of that. But equally, if I toss the climate, the coin of climate action, what do we think is going to be the other side? On the other side is system change. 
Do we need system change as well? Yes, we do. And actually, individual action and system change are two sides of the same coin. It's not an either or. We don't need to go, ah, oh, I'm not going to bother because my actions aren't going to make a difference. Well, maybe they are because you are part of that 400 million people who are the richest people on earth. But equally, it sets a precedent. It says, actually, this is how I want to live my life. I want to live a life that makes the world a happier and healthier place. I want to treat people and the rest of nature with the care that I think it deserves. And maybe that's just a really nice way to live anyway. It's something that we would all want to do. And that sets the precedent. It says this is how we need that system change. So yes, maybe we do need it to be the easiest and cheapest option to travel by bus or to buy fresh vegetables and to eat plants. And we need it to be the cheapest option and the easiest option to not own a car and not to fly, but still to be able to live a life that is full of the really verdant, lush way that we want to live. And that's definitely something that is in Dale's vision, just doing things differently rather than giving things up. So we've got this coin of climate action. We're going to return to that later on. Where are we going next, Chris? <laughs> OK, so we've got another really interactive game. We're going to think about our diets. So we're going to focus in particular on the food we eat. Everyone here has to eat. Everyone on planet Earth eats food. We don't all eat the same food. But if we were going to make a healthy plate, if we were going to think about what kinds of food would make us healthy, we're going to play a game. Now, I'm going to explain this, Chris. Is this going to make sense? OK. We're going to play this where we've got one plate. So here is a plate of food that you might eat in the day. Now, there's how many different food groups, Chris? We've got four, haven't we? Four key ones that we're going to focus on. I'm going to throw the mic over to you. Cool. Um, so whilst we do this, has everyone heard of the healthy plate before? Yes? Cool, lovely. So that's basically what we're going to do. We're going to group our... Ah, perfect. We've got them right here. So we're going to, um, we're going to group what we think a healthy plate should look like. Um, now, first of all, we've got, guys, if you want to want to move in, that's absolutely fine. Right. Whilst you guys are doing that, we'll just explain a little bit about what we're going to do. So <coughs> we've got some beanbags to represent the food group. So first of all, what color do, we, do you think will be green? Vegetables. Lovely. So for this purpose as well, we're going to say fruit and veg. Okay. Lovely stuff. Next one, please, Paul. What about yellow? Carbohydrates, exactly. Chips. And red? Meat, yes, for now. And then blue? Not, that's a good one, not water. So we call, we're talking dairy, okay, or dairy products, okay? Cheese, perfect. So what we want to do now is we want to decide what is the most important factors of a healthy plate, okay? So, yeah, should we get a bit of vote? Should we get one up? Vegetables, veg. So I think we've got mainly veg there as our biggest, biggest proportion. What comes next? What comes next? We've got veg is our biggest, fruit and veg is our biggest. Um, and any, here's a little test for you, any children in the, uh, how much fruit and veg should we be having a day? Five? 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 So, lovely. Thank you very much. So, the recommended is five, but you should be looking at around seven, uh, five to seven portions of fruit and veg a day. Sorry to remind you of that one, kids, on a Sunday. Right. Next one. What do you think is the next biggest? So, we'll say carbohydrates. Yes. Lovely stuff. So, carbohydrates, obviously, where we get our energy from. So they are very important for our diet, very important for me and Paul to be running around this stage, had plenty of carbohydrates to be doing so. And then our final two, which comes next? Meat, yep. Yeah. Or someone said it, I can't, I didn't, I'm not sure who it was, but mentioned protein. And then finally, dairy. Cool. So that is the way that it's broken up. Um, and that is a, a very loose way of doing it. And when it comes to meat and dairy, um, they're often very similar um, with fruit 
and uh, fruit and carbohydrates being the most important factor. And now when I'm talking about this, I'm obviously talking about the, uh, the healthy plate that is um, government recommended. But as you can imagine, as the Ministry of Eco-Education and as Forest Green Rovers, we're going to talk about something a little bit differently, right? So what are we going to take away from our plate? Meat, meat and dairy. Perfect. So, but we're not just going to strip it straight away, are we? We need to figure out what comes instead of it, right? So what we're not going to do is just take something out of your diet. It's not a very good way to do it. You've got to be looking at making sure that diet is still very healthy and, and that the plate is still looking full and you're not just taking stuff off your plate. Yeah, so... The important thing is a vegan or vegetarian diet isn't just a normal diet with things removed. Instead, it's being really creative. And actually, what are some of the biggest sources of protein? We think about meat, but actually there's other things that are even much better sources of protein. Beans, pulses, yeah, all these sorts of things. What were nettles? That's an interesting one. So yeah, what we need to do is change the way we think about food and our plates. And something we've tried to illustrate here is that actually we should anyway be eating far more fruit and veg. That should be a much larger proportion. Actually, the, the meat bit should be a really small proportion anyway if you're thinking about a healthy diet for you. But if you're thinking about a healthy, planet, uh, yeah, healthy diet for the rest of the, the nature and for the planet, you might swap those things out and get those things from other things. We're now going to focus on milk in particular because milk's a really interesting one. In schools, children are provided with cow's milk as a source of calcium. What's interesting is actually some of the alternative milk options now have a higher proportion of calcium because they have them added and they're kind of supplementary. So we're going to explore some of this and we're going to do that by playing a game, another game show, Bruce's Higher or Lower. So I think Chris is going to hold on to the cards. What we've got are some cards with information. We're going to start with our first one. The first one is oats. Put your hand up if you drink oats milk. Oats, you might think of it as like porridge, oats. Now, we've got four categories here. The amount of land that is needed to make one litre. Think of a litre carton. We will get one in a second because we're going to play another game afterwards. Land use. We've also got the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. So we were talking about carbon dioxide. We've got how much water, fresh water, is needed to actually produce one litre of that milk. And then we've got this word eutrophication. And... We probably should have put something else. It means water pollution. And we've heard a lot about water pollution from sewage, but actually the way we farm and agricultural processes also puts chemicals and other things into waterways and causes pollution. So for oat milk, 0 0.76 square meters is needed to produce one, square, uh, one liter of milk. Now, for our next one, which is going to be cow's milk, do you think cow's milk is, uses more land, is it higher, or is it lower than oat milk? Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay, let's see. So cow's milk actually uses 8.95 square meters to produce one liter of milk. And you can see how much bigger it is. This might be a recurring theme. Now, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions as well, we've got three 0.15 kilograms of emissions from one litre of milk compared to our 0 0.9 for oat milk. And you can also see how the other numbers are much, much bigger. Okay, so the next one after cow's milk is going to be almond milk, a nutty one. Do you think almond, let's go with fresh water use, to produce one litre of cow's milk requires 628 litres of fresh water to for the grass, for the cow, for all those things. Do we think it's higher or lower for almond? Almond milk. We think it's, almond milk's gonna be using more water or lower? Lower. Almond, we've got 371. So almond is still quite a high number, but it's nowhere near, it's half that of cow's milk. So almond requires quite a lot of water, 317, uh, 71 liters but it's half that of cows. Okay, we're on to soya milk. And is this our, no, we've got two more. So soya milk next. Now, do we think 
So almond milk releases 0.7 kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions. Do you think soya milk is higher or lower? Soya milk, higher or lower? Higher than 0.7? Who thought lower? We had a couple lower. Okay, let's see what we've got. It is 0.98. Interesting. Okay, and have we got one last one? We've got rice milk. Rice milk is the last one after soya. And we're going to go with the eutrophication. So there is one gram of pollution that goes into streams with the production of soya. Do you think, what did we say it was? It is rice milk. Do we think it's higher or lower? More pollution or less? We think higher. Okay. 4.69 grams. Okay. What we're going to need to do is if we have some of the children at the front, if you would mind holding them up, what we're going to do is have a look at them all together next to each other. Now, there was one of these milks that stood out as being a bit different. Which one was it? It was the cow's milk, wasn't it? The cow's milk was the one, if we hold them up nice and high, cow's milk was the one that stood out as having numbers that are far, far bigger. Now, milk is a really useful like analogy, proxy. It's an interesting one to talk with, about because across all the food we consume, there is a similar story that eating plants is better for us and for the planet. And you can see this in the numbers here that cow's milk is way, way, way bigger. And actually, should we swap you around? Does cow's milk want to come over here? And now, what do we think though of the alternatives? Is there one that's like the next worst? Do we think there's one that's the best alternative? What do we think? Sorry, I'm not answering the question, but what about if the soy is being grown where there's deforestation? True, so there's things that we've not included in this that might be other things you might consider. So yes, soya, uh, deforestation. What's interesting though is the majority of the deforestation for soya production isn't for us to directly consume soya. What's that soya being used for? Feeding chickens in particular, which is feeding the diets of an increasingly wealthy number of Chinese people and you know growing middle classes. So actually, if you really cared about soya, you would stop eating chicken, yeah? And actually, that's a really interesting tale, is most of this is really complicated and interconnected, that the obvious like, answer is often the wrong answer. And that is why this is also a really difficult thing to tackle. So there isn't necessarily one that stands out as being the best, and actually, often, it might be about taste, and that's the next thing we're gonna do. We're gonna have a go at doing some blind milk tasting. So thank you so much. We're gonna collect the cards back up. Okay, and what we need is one very willing uh, assistant. Should we have someone else who maybe hasn't? Should we, who maybe hasn't had a go? Do you want to come home? Yes, come, 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 come. Okay. Now, what we will need to do is blindfold you. <laughs> so what we might ask you to do is, do you mind putting your coat on back to front? And then we can... Uh, yeah, so we can use the hood oh, right. to blindfold you. Because what we wouldn't want you to do is to be able to tell which... Have we got a blindfold? We've got a blindfold. Perfect. This is very resourceful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Sorry, what was your name? Lawrence. Lawrence. So we've got Lawrence. Now, Lawrence, what's your milk of preference at the moment? Cow milk. Cow's milk. Okay. Ooh. It, it's all right. We might be able to turn him. This might be the moment where... Um, Okay, so Chris, what we've got then are three milk alternatives. Being obviously the advocates of plant-based diets, we're not going to try cow's milk here. We wouldn't want to advocate the consumption of cow's milk. So what we've got, well, first of all, is this is sample A. And Lawrence, we're going to pass it to you. Now, if for all of those sort of wine connoisseurs, what's the first thing you might do? You might swirl it around, might you give it a sniff? What are the aromas? <laughs> is there anything though in terms of the flavor anything have you got any idea which one you think this might be god no um there's a lot of fresh in here taste buds it's very nice so it's a very nice one 
Okay, so the guess, Lawrence's guess, this one is oat milk. Okay, we've got sample B. We're going to put, let me help you. We'll put this one down here. There we are, that's sample A. We've got sample B. So I guess this is, is it better? Is it worse? What does this one smell or taste of? Can we taste the difference? What do we think? That's a bit of a funny one. Huh? It's a funny one, apparently. This one's a funny one. I'm going to guess rice. Rice. Ooh, interesting. Okay, so did you have a guess? Are they all unsweetened? I'm not sure we've gone to that extent. You're right, though, that often these can be sweetened and unsweetened. So naturally, many of these alternatives are naturally sweeter, um, but they can be unsweetened and sweetened. Okay, is this the last, the last sample? Sample C. Oh, this one's not very nice. Okay. What do we think this one? So the second one you thought was rice. I'm going to guess this one then is process of elimination, almond. Almond. Okay, so this one could be almond. Do we know what the first one might be? Uh, so we said that rice, oats. Okay. Oats, almond. Oat, right, almond. Okay. Okay. Um, was there one that you liked the most? Um... A combination of the first and second. I won't go. Okay, so if we could mix the two, or yeah. I'm going to go for oat first. Oat. Okay, so maybe the oat is the preference. Okay, Chris, do you want to do the reveal in terms of which one was which? So the sample A. Which one was sample A? Oh yes, please do, Lawrence. Thank you so much. Oh, oat milk. Yeah. And did you say Lawrence? That was the one that you liked. You preferred. Okay, great. P favorite. Um, and then. Sample B, and we thought that was rice. Just to throw a spanner in the works, Lawrence, sample was rice. <laughs> soya, then. Okay, soya. <laughs> Almond. Almond, ooh. So that nutty flavor just didn't come through. And then the last one was soya. soya. Sugar. No sugar. Now, have any of them won you over where you thought? The oat was very nice. I like the oat, I have to say. Yeah, I might go for oat. What? What, yeah, so thank you so much. Please do give Lawrence a round of applause. Thank you so much. What I would say is it is always worth rethinking why you drink cow's milk. Is it just because that's what you've always done? Or is it maybe worth trying an alternative? And I know a lot of people who try maybe oat milk uh, as in their cereal, in their breakfast, because actually that's a really easy one to switch out. You might not notice it so much. But for the planet, that's definitely the thing that you might choose to do. Okay, we have to have a think where we're going next. We do have the mascot. Is this a moment to introduce Neville? Okay. Yeah. So we have got a very special guest here with us today. It's not just me and Paul. Uh, we've got someone even better with us. So we have, who is our Green Devil mascot, Neville. Can we give him a round of applause for Neville? Neville has the tricky task of walking in. <laughs> so what you guys might know, know about Forest Green Rovers is um, before Dale Vince took them over, we were a National League team. Um, and like I said, we were just a village team in Nailsworth. But actually, since Dale has come in, there's been a whole lot of stuff that they've rebranded. It's not just the philosophy that we've done, but it's also the rebranding as well. So if anyone came to watch us 20 years ago, we would have been in black and white. But now we're obviously in our lovely green and black, as sported by Neville. Um, and also, Neville has become one uh, our new mascot as well. Um, so if you do come down to the new lawn, and I do very heavily suggest it, um, you will see this wonderful uh, mascot walking around. Um, so you can give him a high five, give him a wave, uh, get, some few, get a few pictures. And I think we might have some opportunities to have some photos um, after the session, yeah? The very last thing we're going to play now is... Obviously, because of Forest Green Rovers, a penalty shootout. There's going to be a bit of pressure in terms of can you score your goals? But we're going to have a climate twist to this. And the way we're going to have a climate twist is we want you to think about that pledge or action that you could take away from here. And do remember that we said the, the coin of climate action has two sides. It could be 
it could be that an individual action, it could be something like drinking a different milk. Or it could be that you were gonna go away from here and try and help make systems change and you're gonna lobby politicians or you're gonna take part in something else that helps make that system change. So have a think. It could be that it has a focus on energy. It could be a focus on food. It could be transport or it could be something about nature. Have a think. And what we would like you to do is Everyone is welcome to come and take a penalty shootout. But before you take your penalty, you're going to need to shout out the action, the thing that you're going to go away and leave this space and do. Right, so have a little think. We're just going to set up a little bit of a, a goal. Um, what I will say is this is obviously a very important part um, of everything that we're doing, um, but it is at the World Cup final. So please, no one absolutely skying penalties. Um, a lot of the equipment is very expensive and I definitely can't afford to replace any of it. So, Okay, lovely stuff. So guys, if you do want to have a shot at goal, then come, please line up after the, uh, behind this person that we've got just here. Uh, Paul, use a phone ball. So the rules are, before you take your shot, um, you're going to shout out what your pledge is um, to help uh, support the environment, what you're going to do differently, and then you're going to shoot, and then you're going to hit it in the back of the net, and that's you committing to doing that going forward, okay? Paul, do you want to do an example for us? <laughs> okay, I am going to ride my bicycle more. Oh, yes. Lovely stuff. So, can we get your, what, what is your pledge? What is your action you're going to take away from today? Drink more. Drink, drink more oat milk. Lovely. So, we've got drink more oat milk. Can we get some cheering going on? Ready? Go on. Yay! Lovely. Well done. And what's your pledge for today? The same. Okay, we've got some oat milk lovers. Can we get the cheering going again, guys? Come on. Hey! Yes, lovely stuff. What was your pledge? Stop drinking cow milk. Right, we've had a big impact on the milk drinkers today. Can we get the cheer going? Oh, unlucky. Good try, though. And what was your pledge for today? Eat more healthy food. Lovely. Yes! And what's your pledge? What do you reckon? Do we do oat milk as well? We try more oat milk. This is yeah. Cycle more, lovely stuff. Yes, right. Again, the cheering going. Oh, that was the money shot. It went to the camera. So it's even better. Right. Okay. What have we got here for your pledge? Drink more oat milk. Lovely stuff. Oh, I had a bit of a deflection on the way. With your empty word. And what's your pledge? Yes, I'm one of the documents. Eat a lot less meat. Lovely stuff. Hey! Cool. Has everyone had a go that wants to go? Are you sure? We're in the beginning of the extinction. Yeah, I was trying to use that. I completely understand. Don't worry. Cool. So thank you so much. Uh, we are happy to stick around. And if anyone's got any questions, we can answer those. But otherwise, thank you so much for taking part. Hopefully, there is something that you've learned that you can take away and tell other people. It could be about the earth and the story there with the blanket. You could show that to anyone. You could think about the warming strikes and see how you could use those in a story to tell someone. Or it could be using the blind milk to taste. So thank you so much. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, thank you very much, guys, for listening today. Uh, like Paul said, if you have any questions, we'll stick around. Thank you very much. Uh, we have got Neville here, so please come have some photos. Say hello, give him a high five and all that kind of stuff. And hopefully, when we come back next year, and I say, who's been to the new lawn before? We're all going to have hands up, right? Yeah, that's what we like to see. That's a pledge. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you, guys.